ever wish you were a gypsy? There's a lot to be said for it. But you'd miss your TV, wouldn't you? Now take old Pedro there, for instance. He wouldn't live in a house if you paid him. Today, Pedro's caravan is in England's Fen district. He likes it, and so does the stone chat. But then any neglected, lonely ground suits him. It takes sharp eyes to spot his nest, well hidden in a bush and built of grass, moss, hair and wool. A shy character. It's hard to believe he belongs to the same family as the thrush which uses your front lawn as a breakfast table. But he does, even though he's less than half as long as his cousin, the missile thrush. And as for the reed warbler, well, he's so tiny and light, you could post three of him in a one-ounce letter. If you wanted to, which I hope you don't, and if you could catch him, which I'm sure you couldn't. Reed warbler chicks average 70 meals a day each, so both parents have their work cut out. It isn't always like that. The young of the bittern, for example, their appetites are enormous too. But all the work's left to mother. Father couldn't care less. It's the hen bird who builds the nest, sits on the eggs, and feeds the young. And where's father? Oh, he's gone fishing. It's all very well, but mother has to go fishing too, for anything up to seven mouths besides her own. Why does she stick her beak up like that? Well, some think it's for camouflage, so that her beak merges with the reeds and is harder to spot from a distance. Others think it's to spear any attacker who tries dive-bombing the nest. Could even be both, for there's a lot of air traffic about which might or might not be hostile. While those swans are around, our bittern's not sticking her neck out. But you needn't worry, swans don't eat eggs. Actually, you're very lucky to be watching a bittern at home. They're much rarer than they were centuries ago and very, very shy. And you're even luckier to see her family hatching. After all, she only produces one family a year, unlike our friend the reed warbler, who not only produces a second family each summer, but even builds a new nest for it. But then she has her old man's help, while Mother Bitten has to do it all herself, including keeping the home tidy. Broken eggshells would give the position of the nest away. Hey, Mother, it's still there. Hey, Mother. Yes, that's better. Hello, there's Dad. A fat lot of use he is. All the babies are hatched by now, and for two or three weeks they'll do nothing but sit in the nest clamoring for food. Food, food, more food. Sometimes more than they can swallow without a spot of help from mother. The diet? Well, fish, eels, frogs, insects, water voles, and so on. Her spear-like beak is an excellent fishing weapon. If you've ever watched a heron, you may have noticed already that the bittern has very much the same kind of beak, and a similar snaky neck. You may even have guessed that they're members of the same family. If you did, well, you were quite right. The bittern has a much nicer name in some parts of England, where they call it the butter bump. The strange thing about bitterns or butter bumps, is that some of them are quite happy to live in places like Britain all the year round, while others only visit it for the winter. Why their tastes vary is anyone's guess, and no one ever gets near enough to ask. You'll find bitterns everywhere from northwest Africa to eastern Siberia, and every single one of their chicks has an appetite like a horse, and no manners.
Now, here's another Fenland citizen. Can you make out what he is? See that short, blunt head? Yes, you're right, he's an owl. In fact, the short-eared owl. He shuns the limelight and he prefers not to be seen or heard before he pounces. But oddly enough, he doesn't mind daylight and often hunts when the sun's still high. His food? Well, small birds for a start. That's one reason why yellow wagtails like this pair build their nests in thick vegetation. The male yellow wagtail is one of the better behaved husbands. The hen does the actual building, but father takes his share of all the rest, hatching and feeding. Short-eared owl families divide their labor. Father fetches the food, mother dishes it out, and the chicks eat it, and eat it, and eat it. Whole if possible, and sometimes when it turns out not to be possible. By the way, those tufts which give the short-eared owl its name aren't ears at all, they're just feathers. Had enough of birds? Well, let's take a microscope and look at something else that's fascinating to watch. Floating on the water are some gnat eggs. Gnats must have water to hatch, though it can be as little as the puddle that forms in a horse's hoof print. Look, the eggs are hatching into larvae, or wrigglers as they're called, and they do look just like tiny wriggling bits of thread. Britain, for example, has dozens of different kinds of gnat, and 29 of them will give you gnat bites. Not the larvae, of course, but the grown-up insects. This happens to be one of the kinds that doesn't. It has a long Latin name, but its larvae are known as phantoms, because they're as transparent as ghosts. That makes them all the more interesting, because we can see what happens inside them. For example, when they want to rise in the water, they expand little sacks of air inside their bodies, and when they want to sink, they contract them. You've probably seen toy divers that work the same way. The tail of the larva has a delicate little tuft that spreads like a fan, as beautiful as a bird's tail. For comparison, let's move along a fraction of an inch and look at the larva of another kind of gnat. She'll grow up to be a biter. I say she, because only female gnats are bloodsuckers. If he should be a male, you can ignore him. Well, it's not very practical advice, that, come to think of it. Back to the phantoms. Well, they may be harmless to man, but they're deadly to other tiny water creatures. They have antennae like grappling irons, and to anything small enough, they're killers. Watch his last meal on the way down. He's obviously very efficiently designed because fossils have been found which prove that his family has survived practically unchanged for 20 or 30 million years, and probably much longer. The phantom's skin is astonishing stuff. He can breathe through it, so he doesn't need gills. But one thing he can't do is to stretch it as he grows. Like other larvae, including caterpillars, he has to shed it every now and then, particularly when he changes into a pupa, the equivalent of a butterfly's chrysalis. Now he looks more phantom-like than ever, quite transparent except for the two staring black eyes. Folded up in that bulging head are the legs and wings of the perfect insect, steadily preparing for the moment when the pupa will rise to the surface for the last time and the fully grown gnat will split the skin and climb out into the air. And there he is. Well, that's quite enough of gnats. Let's come back into the open air to have a look at something not many people see, one of Britain's larger wild mammals, the badger. In this part of England, Norfolk, they call him the badget. In other places, you'll hear him called the brock, the pate, the grey, or the borson. In southern Ireland, he's the earth dog. And the Chinese, rather unkindly, call him the sweet potato pig. He's very shy, but far commoner than most people think. 
Some forests are full of his footpaths, and if you find one and follow it up, you'll come to the entrance to his burrow or set. And if you're very lucky, you might see his cubs. You'll have to stay very, very quiet and keep downwind. Badgers have better hearing than ours and a sense of smell like a bloodhound's. Badgers eat pretty well anything, which is rare in the animal kingdom, but they're especially partial to rabbit. They don't chase along rabbit holes. They sniff out a rabbit nest from the surface and dig straight down to it. Beat that for expert smelling. And for sweet, well, anything that's going. That set, by the way, you can only see the entrance, but underground it may be huge. There's one, well known to English naturalists, that covers about an acre and is hundreds of years old. Another that has over 50 entrances and so on. It's only in summer that you'll see Brock leave his set in daylight to search for food. And that's the reason for another delicacy, a bee's nest. Or wasps, Brock isn't fussy. Nine times out of ten he'll wolf the lot, bees, grubs, honey and all, without a single sting getting through his tough hide. But there are soft spots. Watch it, Brock. Yes, I told you so. The cubs are tackling something safer, ordinary insects. By the way, the badger does far more good than harm and is officially listed as a useful animal. Of course, if temptation's put right under his nose, for instance, if he's taking an occasional harmless nibble at some chicken food and discovers that a hen's been crazy enough to lay a clutch outside the coop, well, what's a chap to do? And when an animal's so like a human being that he has spare bedrooms for his friends, outside toilets, and a funeral when someone in the family dies, yes, a badger has all those, well, it's hard to grudge him an egg for breakfast now and then, isn't it? Pedro the Gypsy's moving on, perhaps into the Midlands of England, or south into the rich lands of Suffolk and Essex. He goes where the fancy takes him, and so shall we next time we meet. For to those who know it, the countryside, any countryside, is alive with creatures that matter to man. Some of them useful, some of them a nuisance, but all of them interesting.